a son and thou shalt call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from their sins from the 21st verse of the first chapter of the gospel according to St. Matthew in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost Amen God's Christmas gift is his love for us. Love proved by Jesus Christ's death as our sin offering, our redemption. That's his Christmas gift. And that's the foundation for all giving at Christmas. Because because God is giving. The devil is taking This is putting it in the shortest possible terms. God is giving, the devil is taking. God is loving, the devil is hating. God is life-giving, the devil is life-taking. God cherishes and nourishes his people. The devil hates and despises all people especially humans, but every being other than himself. In fact, you might well argue that he hates himself too because of all the damage he did to himself as well as to others. I mention this because, as we're reminded by the church calendar in the days following Christmas, the very first day after Christmas, is that of the martyr, the first martyr of the church, was stoned to death for simply bearing witness to the truth of Jesus Christ. And that's why we heard about him in the second verse of the hymn of of the saints that we sang this just now. There's a war going on, and there's a cost in terms of bloodshed in that war. And another of the feast days that's remembered right shortly after Christmas is one that took place not long after the birth of Christ, the slaying of the innocent children, the babies in Bethlehem by King Herod, uh, the worldly king, not even the the heir heir to the throne but simply a political appointee to the throne by the Roman government who was so jealous of his position that when he heard about the true king of Israel he sought to kill him in his childhood before he could grow up and constitute a threat to Herod's own kingdom Satan And the kingdoms of this world as well are all taking, not giving. Kingdoms of this world live by taking the goods of the people to support the defense of the nation. And they also take the lives of their own people in order to support the peace and defense of the nation. It's always a taking on the part of the king in order to do the job of being the king and keeping the community safe. But God's kingdom is the other way around. He is a giver. He's a life giver. He's like the sun. It shines no matter whether the earth is there or not. It shines forth in all of its energy. And that's the energy that energizes and gives life to the earth and to the other planets. This is a terrible war. And it began in heaven before it was found on earth. With Satan saying, I will be like the Most High. I will take the highest position. Read the 14th chapter of Isaiah and you'll find out 
the plotting and the evil plans and wicked thoughts and envy of Satan. Envy. There it is. I want what somebody else has that's not mine. I envy them that. And when when Jesus was delivered by the Pharisees to Pontius Pilate with a request that he be crucified, even Mark's gospel and Matthew's gospel report that Pilate himself, a pagan and a Roman heathen, knew that the Hebrew leaders, the Pharisees, had brought Jesus to him out of envy. It says it right there. They were the children of the spirit of envy. And it was the same war that started in heaven when, when Satan envied God and began to lie about him and to claim, I'm going to be up top there. It's that same war that then was translated into earth. And Jesus is God's entry into the battlefield of earth. With what? Not taking life, but giving his own life. You see the theme again? God is the giver. Satan is the taker. God is the life giver. Satan is the murderer. And these two come together in Christmas the promise of peace through the blood of the giving of the life of Jesus Christ for us sinners who sided with Satan against him and would be doomed and lost were it not for his bloodshed given instead of taking from us and saying, that's mine, you took it, I'm taking it back. Just the other way around, he says, here, take my life too. And it will redeem you because I won't be destroyed by it as you would be if it's, you were to suffer this penalty. This is God giving in the face of Satan's taking and our siding with Satan and taking to ourselves the things that please us. This is the war that's going on and still going on with grim opposition to God at every step of the way and to Emmanuel when he came to Jesus and to all those who are his and it will go on until the end of time and the the longer it goes on as one of the apostles says the fiercer his wrath Satan's wrath becomes because he knows that he has only a short time left and his kingdom of destruction, falsehood and wrong and death will be at an end through the Redeemer who gave his life to turn it all around and turn the kingdom of taking into the kingdom of giving, the kingdom of hatred and despising others and serving self and pleasing self into the kingdom of loving and redeeming and blessing others and giving them life. The gospel teaches this to us by giving us these examples that we've just contemplated. And Jesus told us that there was an ancient war, even though we didn't know it. We hardly knew it, but he told us explicitly in Matthew 10, he says in verse 34, I came not to send peace, but a sword. That's not that he's sending a sword against us. But he's coming into a world which is divided because of him. And some are against him and some are for him. And that's where the division is. That's why he says, I came not to bring send peace, but a sword. He says in verse 16 of Matthew 10, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. You're not to be part of the, the haters and the takers and the murderers. But you're going to feel the blade. You're going to feel it from Satan. I send you forth in the midst as sheep in the midst of wolves. Look at the contrast between a sheep and a wolf. Reminded of that poem of uh, of William Blake. 
or he, he, he's got two poems. One of them's called the Lamb, and the other one's called the Tiger. And and the Lamb is about that gentle creature munching grass by the creek side in the field. And the Tiger is about this tiger, tiger burning bright in the forest of the night. Who hath framed thy fearful symmetry? Did he who made the Lamb make thee? Says the poet. But God did make them both. But here, here is Jesus likening us to sheep in the midst of wolves. Really. He says, here's his advice to you. Be therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. You are not to fight God's battle. He'll do that. But you bear the witness of truth. You follow in his footsteps. He came as a victim but to tell the truth. And that's what the mar- the first martyr did. When in the process of telling the Pharisees that they were that they were following in the footsteps of their fathers in resisting the Holy Ghost and persecuting all the prophets and killing those prophets that foretold the coming of the Christ and then turning around and becoming the betrayers and the murderers of Christ when he did come and for telling them that truth they murdered him. Before they murdered him, do you know what they did? They stopped their ears against his words. They stopped their ears. They couldn't stand the truth. And with their ears stopped, they ran in a mad rage upon him and threw stones at him and killed him. The word, the word of truth will get you that. But Jesus Christ says, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and humble and harmless as doves. The word will be the sword of God, not you or I carrying a sword. Be truth bearers. God will do the rest. He goes on to say that ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. He's telling us ahead of time about this terrible war that he's in, and he's striking the blow that will be the victorious one. As soon as he gives his life, which he's about to do when he said these things to us, he goes on to say in John fifteen eighteen, If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Why? Because Satan is full of envy, and he wants what God has. And he says, I don't, I don't believe God. I don't believe he's love. But what he has, I'm going to take to myself. He becomes a liar and a murderer. Envy drove him to lying and murder. If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. He's speaking of that ancient hatred of the envious heart of the devil. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you're not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. The servant is not greater than the Lord. They have, and then in verse 24 and 25, he says, they have both seen and hated both me and my father, that this saying may come to pass, the word that might be fulfilled that was written in their law, saying, they hated me without a cause. And there you have it. Satan envied God because he was evil not because there was a cause for it. And John the Apostle takes this up in his first epistle, 3.13. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Now you say, well, look, I'm not feeling... The, the sword, I'm not feeling persecution like uh, the first martyr did and like 
the people that Jesus described, the, the uh, sheep among the wolves. I have a pretty good life. I'm a Christian, and nobody's killing me for it. You can thank God for that, that he founded a country in which Christianity was at the root of it, the cornerstone of it. And so Christianity had a good place to live for a while here in this country. And now, in these days especially, we can see how precarious it is when you take away that Christian foundation. Your safety and mine are no longer as clear as they always used to be. But still, you say, I'm not being persecuted. There are only very few that we know of who die by violence for the Christian faith these days. But it happens. It has happened under the Iron Curtain. It is happening today in places around the world that we don't hear much about. But we get distant reports from it, and we should know about it. This is the struggle that a Christian will face when the chips are down, when you no longer have people in power who are either friendly or neutral towards your Christian faith. So where do we fit in? If we're not to get ready for violence, maybe we are. Maybe we should get ready for that. But there's more we can do. Jesus put it this way. He who is faithful in little will also be faithful in much. You don't have to have the great things conferred upon you and committed to your charge. If you have the little ordinary things of everyday life committed to your charge, he says, love one another. Love one another. That's enough. That's a big order. Because we're not inclined to love one another. We're inclined to be like Satan. We're inclined to be takers. We're inclined to be those who love self and look for ways of pleasing ourselves. All day, every day, we're trying to find a way of pleasing ourselves. And when we do this, we're usually ignoring or riding roughshod over or in some way being inconsiderate or hurtful to somebody else because we put self first. We put ourselves in a high position of esteem and others we don't so much care about. It's like that little family in Narnia where... Edmund was led, led astray by the wicked witch and, and she said, well, you, don't you have brothers and sisters? And he says, yes, but there's nothing special about them. Right? There is, there's the wicked spirit of every little child, every human being. Right from the cradle. Yeah, I have brothers and sisters, I have neighbors and friends, but there's nothing special about them. I'm the one that counts. Right? Good thing to look at those lessons, those stories, and read them and remember and understand. When we have that struggle to to carry on, we're carrying on a struggle which might not be the one that the martyr Stephen faced or that the holy innocents faced or that some of the other martyrs for the church faced. It's not that. But it's the same in spirit. It's taking self off the throne and putting others there first. There's no martyr who died for the love of Jesus Christ who didn't spend a lifetime denying self for Jesus Christ's sake. Denying self means put yourself out for him. Loving another means put yourself out for that other person. That's what it really comes down to. Are you wanting to put yourself out in order to do good to somebody else, even if it's in a very small way? It doesn't have to be in a great matter. Our command is to love one another as Jesus loved us. He gave his life for us. And as the Apostle John says, therefore, we should give our lives for each other. We can, do, we can give our lives Not literally by dying, but by giving up self-pleasing, by giving up self-praising judgments that we nourish and cherish all day long about ourselves, by casting those out and putting somebody else first, praising that person 
finding something good about the person that we thought a minute ago isn't anything special. There's the object of our love according to God's commandments. He that is faithful in little will also be faithful in much. When the time comes for greater sacrifice, if you practice saying no to self and yes to your brothers and sisters in Christ and to anyone to whom you can do good in Jesus' name, you will be in that same spirit when your life is called for and you will witness truly because it's his spirit in you moving you to take that step and his spirit will not leave you but will be present in the worst of challenges that we may have to face if martyrdom does stare us in the face. This is a lifelong process. It's not easy. We're not good at it. We fail every day. All day, every day, we keep reverting to the old self-pleasing attitude self-seeking, self-praising attitude, rejecting others, rejecting our duty to love one another, and in a way, despising God and his commandment and doing it. But every little effort to correct that course, no matter how little and slight it is, is a step in the right direction. And Jesus is there to encourage it, and he honors it. And he's a good shepherd, and he's patient, and he knows that no matter how long a life we live, we will never get this perfectly. We will always be imperfect. We will always be inclined to find ways of pleasing ourselves and forget about putting ourselves out for somebody else's pleasure. It's always going to be that way. We're going to try, and we're going to fail, and we're going to forget. We're going to be inconsiderate, leave somebody else high and dry, and never give it a second thought. Put them out on a limb and don't worry about it because it's not me, it's them. And they're not so special. And they don't have, I don't have them in my eye, my heart, for love's sake. It's a struggle. It's a struggle. It's a small, it seems like a small thing. But that's the struggle that Jesus is leading us in. It's like the Psalm of David. It says, he will lead me into the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. The shepherd, the shepherd is always leading his sheep in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. And the sheep, because they're sheep, are always wandering and always getting out of the path and wandering off. But because he's a good shepherd, he goes after them. He finds them. He brings them back. And he's patient all your life long. He waits. In Isaiah 38, he says, I will, the Lord will wait. He will wait. He won't spring upon you with judgment. He waits because he wants to be gracious. He wants to be merciful. And if you're not in a state where you can receive it, he will wait. And he will lead you in that direction until he can show mercy. That's the good shepherd. That's his leading. And that's this lifelong process. You know, the theologians even have a word for this process. They call it sanctification. It takes a whole life long to become truly holy. But we gain a little by it every day by doing the right thing instead of the wrong thing. There's a verse in Romans that I found a few years ago. And when I found it, I was overjoyed. I thought, I wish I had heard this a long time ago. It's very simple. It's Romans 15, 3, and it says this. Even Christ pleased not himself. Listen to that. I go through all day, every day, and so do you, looking for ways to be pleased with myself. Even Christ pleased not himself. He came into this world to do the opposite, to please the righteousness of God. And to please the goal of saving us from doom and death. And to put his life down in order to do that. 
Even Christ pleased not himself. But the accusations that fell on God fell on him. That's what that verse says. The reproaches of them who reproached God fell upon me. That's one of the prophecies that Paul says pertains to Christ. They fell on him willingly. He took all the accusations from Satan and he let them fall upon him and cause his death. He became the curse that Satan invoked and that fell upon all of us through him. Jesus became that curse for us. He pleased not himself. And so he invites you and me and little things every day not to go about plotting how we can please ourselves, but to think at least about the fact that we're commanded to go about plotting how we can benefit someone else for whom Jesus died. And now you are in the same spirit that he had on Calvary, the spirit of giving, not taking. The opposite of the taking spirit of the devil. God, lead us to think lowly and meekly of ourselves, daily rejecting inner self-praise, inner self-pleasing, as an act of love for my Savior, Jesus Christ, who meekly went to the cross and gave up his life for me, and so saved me, and all the world who will believe in him. Thanks be to God for his unspeakable Christmas gift of love shown to us in the death of his son, Jesus Christ. For in his name we pray. Amen.